morning, everyone. Let us, let us begin our worship this morning. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with us. We have several announcements, but first I'd like to introduce who's here today. We have the Reverend Jim Mosley. He comes to us for Communion Sunday today from the Campbell Presbyterian Church. As many of you know, he and his wife, Susan, moved here from Delaware several years ago and are finding it a lot better down here weather wise than having to shovel all the snow up in Delaware. Mm -hmm. We also have our music ministry today. We have Lynn there behind the piano, Susan Burton, and Gail Pittman, who will be doing our singing today. I'm Ben Burton, I'm your liturgist today. We have several announcements. Uh, first of all, on behalf of the Finance Committee, I do want to thank everyone for continuing to send in their pledges and, and offerings. It is helping to keep the church moving, even though we're not able to vote or to be here in person all the time. Uh, that is a, a very essential part of it. We do have several other announcements. Uh, Amy Ryan is doing well after her several surgeries and is home recuperating, hoping to get back to work. As you all know, Amy was probably very anxious to get back to work, but she is recuperating. Another uh, gentleman from the congregation, Dave Albert, I'm sorry to say, fell and, and had surgery for uh, broken bones. Uh, we pray for his recovery. We all can't be here during this time. It is a communion Sunday. It's also, as you know, Super Bowl Sunday. Mm -hmm. Usually, we're out there collecting cans of soup and cash to give to the uh, food bank. This year, we can't be there and do that. So I've got a challenge for you. Sue and I have a challenge. We've got the Tampa Bay chicken noodle soup. And we've got Kansas City cheese, tomato basil soup. What we're willing to do, you call in between after the service is finished and between 3 o'clock on Sunday afternoon and let the church office know your preference for soups. Tampa Bay chicken noodle or tomato basil. And we'll match that up to $100. $100 challenge to benefit the food bank. You call in with your preferences for who's going to win the Super Bowl between, and let us know by 11, between 11 and 3 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. I don't believe there are any other announcements that we have this morning. But if, so let us prepare our hearts and our minds for the worship of Almighty God. Thank you. 
Please join me in the call to worship and read responsibly. Have we not known? Have we not heard? Has it not been told to us since the beginning? Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Gracious God, you call us to follow Christ and spread the good news of your love for all people. Help us all to become all things to all people that we might reach many with your good news. Amen. We fool ourselves that we think our ways are hidden from God. Therefore, let us confess our sin, trusting in the mercy of God our Maker. Please join me in the prayer of confession that's printed in your bulletin. God, you are ever asking, the creator of all that is. Your understanding is beyond measure. We confess to you that we have sinned against you and our neighbors. In your compassion, forgive us, for we place our hope in your steadfast love. Amen. Praise the Lord. Our God heals the brokenhearted and binds up our wounds. God takes pleasure to those who place their trust in God's grace. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Let us pray our prayer of illumination. Holy God, speak to us what has been told from the beginning, your word that is the foundation of the world. Amen. Grace be unto you, it is my pleasure and privilege to be with you this morning at St. Andrew's, a sister congregation of our Presbyterian Church family. The text this morning is a reading from the Gospel of Matthew. I invite you to hear and listen now for a word from the Lord. Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. Now when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and that all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And the righteous will say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to visit you? And the king will reply, truly I tell you, when you did, or even one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did it for me. And then he will say to those upon the left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal for fire prepared by the devil and his angels for I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat I was thirsty you gave me nothing to drink I was a stranger you did not invite me in I needed clothes and you did not clothe me I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me and they will also answer Lord when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? And he will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. 
Friends, here ends the reading of the gospel. May we be blessed with the wisdom to understand and the courage to undertake these holy words. Amen. Well, friends, to be frank, in this story, the goats get the worst end of the deal. The text says that the shepherd will separate the sheep from the goats. The sheep will be placed on the right, the seat of privilege. The goats should be seated on the left, the place of less honor, dishonor. So why is it that the goats get the bad rap? There must be something about goats that folks just don't like. Because I can't imagine why they always get the bad end of the story. So I did a little homework on sheep and goats to think and to learn about the differences between these two creatures. I don't know, you may know something about goat herding and sheep. Some folks have some experience with these critters. But here are some of the more important differences I want to share with you. Did you know this? That sheep graze, they nibble, but goats forage. They will eat anything in sight. Tree limbs and stumps and anything green is fair game for goats. Sheep are docile. I think that's a nice word for boring. But goats are curious. They like to investigate, and so they're always getting into trouble. Sheep have tails that droop. Goats have tails that stick up. Some sheep, some varieties, have manes, like a horse has a mane. Goats have beards, goatees, we call them. Sheep have horns that go round and thick and curl, while goats have slender horns that curve. Sheep are stocky, goats are lean. Sheep rarely, sheep readily gather in flocks and are easy to herd. Goats are more independent. But here's the most important difference. Shepherds who keep sheep protect the sheep from injury by the environment around them, while goat herds, goat herds protect the environment from the goats. Now let that sink in. Sheep need protection or they will be hurt by their environment, but goats need to be restrained or they will damage the environment around them. So I'm just wondering how that knowledge makes a difference in what we glean from the passage this morning. That would be an interesting discussion. But let's look at Matthew and how Matthew portrays these critters, this situation. First, we have to remember that we're near the end of the reading of Matthew. There are just three chapters remaining in the entire gospel itself. He's speaking about summarizing all of what he has been writing and speaking and saying about the life of Jesus. He also anticipates that the people of God, the young disciples, the young church, during this time of persecution, is looking at end times, what we call the eschaton in theological circles. Matthew believes that perhaps the final days have come upon the church. It is a time of tribulation and persecution. But he writes to say, beloved, my friends, the Messiah is coming, the Messiah will come. Redemption draws near. He's speaking about that event that we often call the second coming, when Jesus shall return. Now we know about his first arrival. We've been through the season of Christmas and Epiphany, when Jesus comes to us as a child, he lives the life of a servant. He dies as the victim of Roman tyranny. But in this instance, in this chapter, when Matthew speaks about Jesus coming, there's a very different tone. For when the Messiah returns, he returns to us as the Son of Man, a term that Matthew draws from the Old Testament, particularly from the book of Daniel. The Son of Man describes a prophetic figure designated as God's emissary who speaks on behalf of God and acts on behalf of God. This 
is the title that Jesus often prefers for himself. The Son of Man is coming, and a company of angels shall be with him, and he shall judge the nations. This is the picture of a royal court. This is an account of an awesome power. This is no Bethlehem story here. He shall separate the nations one from another, the sheep from the goats, the sheep to the right and the goats to his left. And Matthew is quick to say how it is that this judgment shall be practiced. He describes the sheep in this way, come all who are blessed by my father, receive your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the beginning of the world. I was hungry, you gave me food, thirsty, you gave me drink, homeless, you gave me a room. I was shivering and you gave me clothes. I was sick, you stopped by, you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. The good, the righteous sheep are surprised by this wonderful invitation to glory. When did we see you this way? Sick, homeless, thirsty, hungry. And Jesus says, when you cared for the least, for the least among you, when you gave comfort to the least, to anyone overlooked, anyone ignored, you did it for me. Now in the interior of the country of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, there is a vibrant, remarkable, astounding church. And among that Christian community, Presbyterians are a prominent church among the Christians of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. They are a very strong church and a vibrant church, and that vibrancy is built upon mission work begun by Presbyterians going back to as far back as 1888. It's when we sent our first missionary workers into the Congo. There were other missionaries there, most missionary settlements were along the coast. But these missionaries, William Henry Shepherd among them, along with Samuel Lapsley, the two of them had felt the call to move to the interior of the country to establish an outpost for the faith. William Lapsley died less than a year in of tropical fevers. But William Henry Shepherd an African-American, William Henry Shepherd remained in the Congo for 22 years. He established schools and clinics. He built churches. He built relationships with dozens of tribes. But what made him a great treasure to the Congolese people was his role in exposing the cruelty of the tyrannical rule of King Leopold of Belgium who claimed all that area of Congo as his personal property. He was a tyrant of the worst kind. His mercenary groups would herd villages of Congolese people and demanded them the harvest of what was then the rubber substance, not grown in plantations, but harvested from vines in the tropical rainforest. William Henry Shepherd exposed the cruelty of Leopold by taking pictures of young natives with severed hands and those who had been tortured. Those pictures stirred international conscience and that moved Leopold to eventually withdraw from the Congo. It's the work of such saintly people as William Henry Shepherd that proved to the Congolese people that they had not been forgotten, that God was with them, that God was among them. Such courage demonstrates how the Church of Jesus Christ becomes a vibrant part of missionary work in all four corners of the world. There are perhaps a dozen churches of our denomination that continue the work of William Henry Shepherd in the Democratic Republic of the Congo the previous church I served was among those, and I had occasion to travel to the DRC, to the Congo. One morning in 
the village we were, uh, which was our place of residence, early in the churchyard, the women began to prepare a meal. And I asked them, in a clumsy way, is there to be a big church event today? And their response was, no, this is not a meal for the church. This is for those who are in prison for in our area of the country. Those who were put into prisons are not regularly fed by the prison at all. To survive in this situation, families and friends must come and visit and bring food and bring clothing and medicines if their loved ones are to survive. And many have no families, not nearby. And so we prepare a meal twice a week. We take clothing, we pray with the prisoners, we try to get messages to them from their families. And among us, often the women will take their children to ensure that they are safe and stay in school. Such compassion amazed me. That demonstration of mercy, of serving the least, was a powerful witness to the prisoner and to the guards, for often the guards would confiscate the food that the women would bring. And I imagine they would respond with great anger, and she said, no. She said, even the guards are hungry. And so we take food for them as well. I think these women were sharing and teaching me the story of the good sheep. Their demonstration of compassion taught me something about sharing mercy with others. And by this experience, I began to understand what Jesus was saying. Don't judge anyone, for the first part of mercy is not to judge. Don't judge the people whom you help. Show them mercy. Don't judge the guards or the prosecutors. Don't judge the cynics, those who would say, forget the prisoner, lead them where they are. They're a victim of their own circumstance. But no, don't judge. Be merciful. No act of mercy is a small thing, whatever it may be. A visit, a prayer, a written note, a gesture, no act of mercy is a small thing in the kingdom. But there's something more here I think Jesus is teaching. Jesus is teaching, giving us something new to ponder. As one writer says, Jesus in this text throws us a curveball. For in this text, we are to be judged not about what we profess, not what we say we believe, not what we confess we believe, not the church we attend, or our alliance, or our association with people of privilege and power. That's not the condition by which we earn merit with Jesus. There is no mention of this text about our profound and deep confession of faith. No. Jesus, in this text, in this story, sets another standard. Because Jesus would say to us, even the Gentiles and unbelievers, even those who do not profess me, but by their mercy and their compassion, they care for the least, then they care for me. They too shall have a place at the right hand of the king. They too shall inherit the kingdom. And then the Son of Man shall turn to the goats and say to them, Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fires. And they shall be surprised, and they will stare at disbelief. What are you talking about? When did we see you hungry or thirsty or homeless or in prison? If you had shown us, if you had told us, if you had called us, if you had texted us, we would have been there. You should have told us. We had no idea. You can't blame us. We just didn't know. But Jesus blames. Jesus judges. Jesus lifts up to say, you call yourself righteous. 
and beloved and churchgoers. But day after day after day, you walk past the homeless and the lame and the least as if they never existed. This indifference declares, Jesus says, simply that the life you lead reveals the condition of your heart and the master whom you serve. A life of mercy reveals Jesus as your Lord and love in your heart. A life of selfishness reveals that you are of hard-heartedness and that your master is your own greed. Jesus alerts us, warns us, and invites us that the life we lead is a demonstration of the Lord we serve. And the Lord we serve tells us something of the condition of our hearts. But when we do it to the least among us, we do it under Christ. Here is the gospel. Friends, hear these words and believe and love and show mercy to one another. Amen. Please pray with me. Holy God, our holiness is incomplete. Our holiness is, is in so many ways shallow. So we beg of you as we pray to you Infuse us with a holiness that is deeper and broader than anything that we of our own account can muster. Give us the holiness and the merciful, the merciful heart of a gracious God. For this is our prayer. Incline your ear to us, O God, and grant us your peace. Amen.
My friends, this is a table not of the church. This is the table of Christ. And all has been made ready. All has been prepared for the feast of this morning. So come, all of you who have much faith, and those of you who have little faith, come, all of you who have partaken of this meal often, and those who have not shared this meal in a long, long time. Come, all of those you who have followed Christ and those who have failed. Come, not because it is I who invite you, but it is Christ who invites you. And it is His will that those who yearn for Him shall find Him, shall meet Him at this meal. Let us pray. Holy God, we praise You. Let the heavens be joyful and the earth be glad. We bless You for creating the whole world and for your promises to your people Israel, and for Jesus Christ in whom your fullness dwells. Born of Mary, he shares our life. Eating with sinners, he welcomes us. Guiding his children, he leads us. Visiting the sick, he heals us. Dying on the cross, he saves us. And risen from the dead, he gives us new life. With thanksgiving we take this bread and this cup and we proclaim the death and resurrection of our Lord receive our sacrifice of praise pour out your Holy Spirit upon us that this meal may be for us our communion with Christ our Lord unite us in faith encourage us with hope inspire us to love that we may serve as faithful disciples until we feast at your table in glory. We come before you with the weightiness upon our hearts of those whom we love, those that were sick or injured, those who are lonely and in despair. And our prayer, Lord, is that your spirit would be sent out to visit those whom we love with comfort and healing. We even pray for our adversaries, those who would do us harm. We believe, O oh God, that in your wisdom there is the strength to change hearts and to change lives. So we pray that that spirit be at work in this world in places of trouble and tribulation. Pray for our church and for the saints of St. Andrews and for their love and devotion and service that they give to you through their membership in this congregation. We pray for their discernment. We thank you in many ways for a time when we have to search our hearts and renew ourselves and our commitments to move away what clutters our lives and to focus on what is ultimate and eternal, what is most sincere and needed, to be merciful one with another, that we might be merciful unto you. Lord, hear our prayers and our petitions, even as we are bold to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, sat at table with his disciples. And after the meal, he took bread. And after blessing it, he broke it, saying, This is my body, which is to be given for you. Take and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we, in the same manner, take whatever portion of bread you have set apart. Friends, this is the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Let us share it together.
And our Lord took the cup, saying, This shall be a sign for you, a new covenant, a promise. My life, my love, my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink of it. Do so in remembrance of me. For as often as you break this bread and share this cup, you share the love of Christ to all the world until he should come again in all glory. My friends, the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation, let us share together. And having been sustained on the bread and the cup, having joined in communion with the saints of all times and places, let us pray. Lord God, thank you for this meal, a portion of the great banquet, of the great heavenly banquet. May it strengthen us and give us grace kindness, mercy, and inspire us to be good witnesses to that love which changes all hearts, and by changing hearts which changes situations which changes this world. Help us to grow and to mature into the likeness of Christ our Lord, in whose name we make this prayer. Amen. Friends, it is your generosity and your service that gives the church its life and its sustenance. So week to week, we take time and invite you to renew your commitment to the body of Christ and the work of this congregation through your prayers and your contributions. And we speak aloud our great thanksgiving and our great appreciation appreciation for your generosity. So as we keep this time alive in our worship, please bow with me for a prayer of dedication. Let us pray. Lord God, all we have is yours, all that we have. And so we take a moment to be reminded of your generosity and we return to you a portion of what we have for the work of your kingdom so that where there is illness, there, there shall be the comfort of medicine. Where there is loneliness, there shall be the comfort of friendship. Where there is homelessness and hunger, your people, this body of Christ, shall be ever-present. So please take what we offer of our hearts, and our minds and our spirits. Bless it and use it for the work of your kingdom. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Each week, part of our service is to offer unto God specific prayers. Many names of congregants have been named aloud for your prayers throughout this week. The scripture says we are to be a people of prayer, constantly praying in all circumstances for one another. Earlier, and in the end of last year, in the tension of matters of politics and campaigning, a church wrote a prayer, and it was a prayer for our nation. It was inviting the nation to be ever mindful of God's hand to God and direct us. I'd like to share in part some of the language of that prayer as part of our pastoral prayer this morning and invite you to let it, let it marinate in your heart for the coming week. So I'm going to step to the lectern here and invite you to hear a part of this prayer. 
Please pray with me. Almighty God, to whom we must account for all our powers and privileges, guide the people of these United States through this season of elections and turmoil and hope. Be with our officials and our representatives. Be with those who administrate the laws of this land, who protect the rights of all people. Be with those who ensure our right and freedom to worship and to call upon your name. Lord, you have bound us together in a common life. Help us in the midst of our struggles for justice in our midst to know truth, to confront one another without hatred or bitterness, but to work together with mutual forbearance and respect through Jesus Christ our Lord. Grant, O oh God, that your life-giving and Holy Spirit may move every human heart, and especially the hearts of the people of our nation, May the barriers which have divided us crumble and suspicions disappear and hatred cease that our divisions would begin to heal, that we would live in true justice and true peace through Christ our Lord. For the former president, Donald Trump and his family, go with them as a new life, a different life unfolds and for the arriving president, for Joe Biden and his family, be with them and bless them, grant them wisdom in the work which they must do. Remind us that when we disagree and that when we are in conflict, Lord, we would ask for your wisdom to rain down upon us. Help us to remember the good things and the glad tidings which you have brought into our lives through the life and death and resurrection of our Lord. Lord, grant us moments of silence to be still and to wait upon your word and your wisdom, for you alone are our rock and our salvation, our strength in the time of need. We pour out our hearts before you, for hallowed and blessed is your name, and great is your kingdom above all kingdoms. This is our prayer. Incline your ear to us, we pray, and grant us your peace. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. For the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the comfort, the courage, and the quickening of the Holy Spirit rest upon you now and indeed forevermore. Amen.